welcome back to Combat Mission Shock Force 2, where we're going to have a go at the ATGM ambush scenario and hopefully build on the firefight series and the Bradley unit guide a little bit. For this mission, we have a non standard US armored cavalry scout platoon, and our job is to do some aggressive reconnaissance up this road towards the mountains. This is the only paved road in the area, so we can expect the enemy, who are apparently Syrian 3rd Battalion mech infantry, whatever that means to at least be watching it, and given the title of the mission, I think we can safely guess that they might have some anti-tank guided missiles. The Americans here have two main objectives. We get 100 points for reaching the mountain pass objective at the far end of the map, and 225 for killing the enemy, with those points weighted 125 for AT units, 50 for enemy HQ units, and 50 for anyone else. Given that we're probably going to have to neutralize the enemy force in order to reach the mountain pass objective, that's what I'm going to be focusing on. The map is about 800 by 360 meters and basically forms a cross-shaped valley. The main road that we're probing up runs from top to bottom and about 200 meters before the far map edge it's crossed by a secondary road. The two roads are in the low ground, which is completely open and flat enough to offer minimal protection. The areas of high ground are a lot more rugged. The two closer areas are pretty bare apart from a few sparse trees and have plenty of changes in elevation that are big enough to hide Bradleys in. The two more distant areas are much flatter on top with a bit of very light forest. The valley sides are also frequently interrupted by patches of rocky ground that are impassable to vehicles. From a tactical perspective, it seems reasonable to expect any enemy units to be set up on the high ground at the top of the map. From here, they'll have long fields of fire and be able to concentrate that fire on any US vehicles coming around the corner over the crest at the other end of the valley. There's a line of rocky ground in between the American setup zone and the left hand valley side too, so while infantry will be able to immediately get up there and bypass the kill zone in the valley floor, any vehicles trying to get up there would have to expose themselves. The core of the force I have to tackle this with is a trio of M3A3 Bradley Cavalry fighting vehicles with three four-man scout teams backed up by the Platoon HQ, another three-man scout team and an N240 team riding in an unarmed Humvee, a recon Humvee with a very fancy long-range advanced scout surveillance system mounted on it and one with a less fancy but considerably more shooty M250 caliber machine gun. This scout platoon also has a two-gun section of 60mm mortars on core, with 30 high explosive rounds and two rounds of white phosphorus. This kind of force almost generates a plan for us. The vast majority of our firepower is mounted on those three Bradleys, so it's just a matter of finding targets for them. This might seem a little simplistic, but simplicity is important. The more complicated things are, the easier it is for them to go wrong. Down in the finer details, given that we're expecting to be facing anti-tank weapons here, it's probably going to be a good idea to minimize the exposure of the M3s. I've only got three of them after all, and while they might be killing machines, they're not only nothing near invincible, but each one represents a significant amount of combat power to lose. So it's going to be up to the infantry to spot the enemy. For this, I can equip the three four-man scout teams with javelins from the Bradleys. This way they can use the thermal imager and optics on the launch units, and I can get them up onto the nearest high ground. Obviously, just because we're using the infantry here to help keep the Bradleys safe, doesn't mean we want the infantry to get whacked by something either. The orders here are to move quick up to just below the crest of the slope, and then crawl forward until they can see over the top. This is a trade-off. Crawling the teams forward will tire them out pretty fast and take some time. These things are both limited. There are only 40 minutes in a scenario, and the troops have limited stamina. I don't want to knacker them out completely in the first few turns. Once they're in position, it doesn't take long to get a couple of spots. On the far right, there's a single Syrian pixel truppen, who is probably important because he keeps using binoculars. And again, on the right at the back, we spotted a Syrian soldier with a PKM, and one with an RPG. These guys are in the same unit, so we can be pretty certain that there's a Syrian infantry squad there. We're not going to do anything about them just yet. We're going to wait for a few turns and see if we spot anything else. The scout teams are probably safe at this distance, especially when they're prone like this. A couple of turns later and no, we haven't got any more spots. 
this doesn't mean there's nothing else there. So I'm going to get the three man scout team and the M240 up online with the other teams and then see if we can't attract some attention. Running the three man scout team forward on the left doesn't seem to get a response from the enemy, which is probably good news because it implies they can't see my scouts. Also, while they were making their move, the other scouts have spotted a few more bodies in the two enemy teams on the right, and more importantly, the M240 team has spotted an enemy SBG-9 on the right side of the crossroads. The SBG-9 is a recoilless rifle, pretty much the main gun of the BMP-1 on the tripod, and it fires a heat projectile very similar to an RPG-7. It can absolutely take out a Bradley at these kinds of ranges, and also has some high explosive rounds that can do nasty things to our infantry scouts. So we better do something nasty to it first. We've got a couple of options. We could try and hit it with a javelin, but none of the javelin equipped teams can currently see it. We could roll one of the Bradleys up and try a shoot and scoot engagement, but that's not a good idea given that the SPG-9 is unlikely to be the only Syrian AT asset ahead of us. The MT-40 itself can't engage directly because it doesn't quite have line of sight, probably to do with the low tripod, and anyway, recoilless rifle versus GPMG is not the kind of firefight that the GPMG is going to decisively win at this kind of range. So the SPG-9 is safe for a few turns at least. I am moving the platoon HQ up though, so hopefully we can hit it with the light mortar soon. I'm also following up the three-man scout team with one of the javelin equipped teams to see what we can see from the next position. The route over there seems pretty safe, thanks to the ground and the distance. Before the situation can develop any further, the three-man scout team decides to kick things off. I haven't given them a target arc to stop them engaging things on their own initiative, and when they crawl up to their crest, they spot the SPG-9 and open fire. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. Reconnaissance is about information gathering, and you don't need to be all sneaky to do that. That said, the scouts do take a little fire from the infantry squad PKM and an SVD marksman near the SVG-9. The SVD looks like it's from a HQ unit, and its proximity to the recallless rifle implies that there's something else worth hitting there too, so we'd better hurry up with the mortars. The scouts have also spotted a truck down there, but they've failed to actually hit anything with their M4, so it's probably a good idea to bring them back a little. To help out with this, the M240 puts some fire out on the Syrian rifle squad, with one of the bursts hitting a soldier who was using binoculars moments before. Again, binoculars usually imply somebody is important, so hopefully we for the squad leader, but regardless, the scouts manage to crawl away unharmed. It looks like the right side of the valley is relatively known to us at the moment, so when the 60mm mortars come in, I'm going to push the Bradleys forward to get eyes on it, using the left valley side to mask them from the left rear hill. The one confirmed enemy AT asset on the right will have 60mm mortar bombs raining down on it, meaning it shouldn't be that effective, and three Bradleys should hopefully be enough to spot and neutralise anything else that presents itself. It's still risky, but we've been observing that side almost since the start of the game, so we can be pretty confident we've seen most of what the enemy has over there. Soon, the final spotting round lands not too far away from the recoilless rifle, taking out the loader. That's the cue for the platoon HQ to call fire for effect, and for the Bradleys to roll forward. Almost the first thing that happens is a Syrian AT-4C engages the Bradleys. It's just been sitting there in full view the whole time, and we never spotted it. The only reason we've spotted it now is that it's launched a missile. Luckily, the operator seems to lose control and the missile plunges into the valley bottom. The Bradleys are able to spot, engage and neutralise the ATGM before it can reload. But it just goes to show that sometimes the best way to find out where the enemy is, is to give him something to shoot at. You're never going to get a complete picture of the enemy force through observation alone, so you're always going to be operating in an environment of incomplete information, which can include nasty ATGM shaped surprises. The SPG-9 is also spotted and engaged by the Bradleys, though by now the mortars have knocked the crew down from 4 to 1, and they pick the last man off with a burst of coax. Nothing else is shooting at us from this side of the valley, so it's probably pretty clear. It's taken us about 17 minutes to get to this point, and 15 minutes of that was staring at the terrain, trying to spot the enemy. It's worth considering that rolling the Bradley straight up would have been riskier, but also used up less time. Now though, we're concerned with the far left. 
One of the forward scout teams has spotted a PK machine gun set up on the back left hillside, and while I'm not tremendously worried about that in and of itself, it's a good defilade position that implies the enemy might have other assets there. To deal with this, we're going to move forward. I think I can just about get one of the Bradleys up onto the left valley side behind my scouts. This is a little risky, but probably worth it for getting a 25mm cannon and a lot of powerful thermal optics into a position that dominates the right rear hill. I know there's one squad of enemy infantry up there and I can't imagine it's alone. Obviously we get points for destroying them, but hopefully the enemy on the left will be able to see their buddies getting pasted. It's not good for morale. The first Bradley gets up with no trouble, although it needed some careful orders plotting through the rocky patches, and soon I've managed to send a second one after it as well. The scout team on the far left is starting to get incoming fire from an uncomfortable number of directions at once. The PK team has opened up, and the infantry squad PK on the right has joined in, plus the SVD down by the X SPG9, and another SVD from a second HQ unit on the left rear hill. The scouts need to bug out, especially after one of the pixel trappers is lightly wounded, but on the other hand, all these enemy units opening fire are exposing themselves to the Bradleys, who are now in position to smother them with 25mm cannon fire. The results are encouraging, the PK team is quickly shut down, and the infantry squad has now taken enough abuse to decide to run away. From this point on, it's an exercise in probing forward with the scouts to find and neutralize more targets. The Bradleys on the valley side are sort of stuck where they are. They can push forward, always behind the scout teams, but the next firing position available through the rocks is not a good one. So the emphasis has somewhat switched over to the infantry now. They are moving up. There's some dead ground behind the next ridge on the left valley side that I'm able to exploit. I want to get eyes on the left side of the crossroads before going any further, because that's the area my Bradleys are going to be exposed to. And lo and behold, down in the defilade there's an empty UAZ Jeep and a second SBG-9. The recoilless rifle is a little difficult to engage due to the terrain, I don't want to walk right up in front of it, but the scouts can't see it while they're prone so it takes a little manoeuvring with the teams to get a good line. The SPG-9 gets a shot off, which misses, thanks mostly to the fact that it's trying to fire at some little heads poking over the crest of the hill. The scouts also spot a second AT-4C and hit it with a javelin, which might seem like gratuitous overkill, but I'll take it. And then they're able to push up and get some fire onto the SPG-19, killing the gunner and then finishing it off. I am somewhat lucky again here. One of the SPG-9 crewmen is determined not to die without firing off all of his AK ammunition, no matter how much suppression he gets. That's a lot of rounds coming my way at close range, but fortunately he manages to miss with them all. Pushing the scouts a little further reveals a Syrian scout team just down the slope, which panics and runs. Not that it helps, they're gunned down at close range. By now I'm pretty confident that there are no more enemy AT assets. We've got four confirmed kills, two AT4s and two SBG9s, which conforms to the two AT4s and two SBG9s of a Syrian anti-tank platoon. I still need to be wary of the RPGs carried by Syrian infantry, which they remind me about when I push the Bradleys up to the next high ground, but we've really entered the mopping up phase now. The third Bradley is now punched up from the valley bottom to the right valley side, where it can engage the rear left hillside, bringing along one of the scout teams for support. The Syrians are still capable of inflicting damage. Someone has been trying to adjust mortars onto my force all game. Without much success, I've been moving forwards fast enough to avoid them, until the systems operator on the recon Humvee is killed by shrapnel. This is mostly because, even though I saw the mortar barrage coming, I forgot to button him up. Well done, me. On top of that, one of the scouts probing the top of the right-hand hill is killed in a short-range firefight with the enemy team just over the crest. Ideally, I'd want to circle around the back of the map and open up new angles to engage that enemy team from a distance, but time is almost up, so I'm willing to accept more risk than I usually would. Luckily that enemy team turned out to be another scout team and not another AT asset that might shoot a Bradley in the back as it goes for the mountain pass. So I have a clear run to grab the objective before we get to the end. 
Before I can do so though, and with two minutes to go, the Syrians surrender. They've lost 26 men dead and 15 wounded, with only 11 survivors scattered around. The force I sent up onto the left valley side has unsurprisingly chalked up the most damage, with the two Bradleys getting 13 and 10 kills, the scouts scoring another 10 altogether and the platoon HQ getting 5, which would include the 60mm mortar strike. This actually struck me as a really good kind of learning mission. As the Americans, the player has a lot of firepower, but it's quite fragile firepower concentrated in the Bradleys. Playing too aggressively runs the risk of the Bradleys getting taken out by the Syrian AT assets, but playing too cautiously risks being caught by the timer. So it's about finding a good balance between risk and progress, finding ways to use all that American firepower without losing it in the process. And of course there's more ways to do it than I've shown here. If you've got the game, give it a go. It's a pretty good evening. Hope you all enjoyed this video and found it useful. I'll catch you in the next one.